Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, Shaykh al-Islam in his Majmu'un Fatawa, he says the following, when a believer commits a sin, he is able to protect himself, herself from the repercussions of that sin in 10 different ways. For those who fear a debt that they have accrued with respect to sins that they fear may catch up with them one day or another in this world or in the next, what do you do to erase the consequence of that sin? He said number one is to engage in istighfar. For you to say astaghfirullah when you make a mistake, when you commit a sin, you move your mouth and you move your heart simultaneously and you make an apology to your Lord. My Lord, I make a mistake. Astaghfirullah. Allah forgive me and Allah erases sins. I share with you one beautiful hadith before before we move on to the next, Abu Dawood narrates on the authority of Ali that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, any human being who commits a sin, and you know your sins, then he stands up and he carries out wudu and he makes it a good wudu. And then you pray two rak'ah of salah, then you do istighfar, Allah will erase this. Number two, he said you engage in tawbah, repentance. He said, because the one who repents from a sin is just like the one who never committed the sin. La ilaha illallah. You will now say to me, what is the difference between istighfar and tawbah? What is the difference between me saying, astaghfirullah, Allah forgive me, and repenting to Allah? Are these not the same thing? I say to you, there is a similarity and overlap, but there is also a divergence, a difference. A difference is that istighfar, to say, Allah forgive me, deals with the sins of your past. Tawbah, repentance, deals with your past, deals with your present, and corrects your future as well. And that is why Tawbah has conditions. Tawbah, what are the conditions? You know them. To feel regret for the sin that you committed, that deals with your past. What's condition number two? To stop the sin at the moment. Stop it. That deals with your present. Then number three, to promise Allah that you will never return to it again. That deals with your future. We can say that Tawbah is the outcome and the entry to it is Istighfar. The same way you can only fill a vessel when you first emptied it. And that's why Allah said, Do Istighfar, apologize to your Lord, then turn to Him in repentance. Number three, you follow up that sin with good deeds because good deeds by their nature, they erase sins. So what we perhaps didn't know is that the doing of good deeds not only establishes your place in Jannah, it also removes your sins simultaneously. Allah said, Inna al hasanati yudhibn al sayyiat. Allah said, Good deeds by their nature, they eliminate sins. How kind is Allah? Number four, or when your righteous brothers and sisters from the believers make dua that Allah Almighty forgives your sins, whether you are dead or alive, Allah will save you from your sins that way. Allah forgive him. Allah pardon her. Oh Allah have mercy. Allah allow that addiction to leave them. That benefits you and it helps you and I emerge from our sins. So ask yourself, look into your circle of friends, the five closest associates you may have. How many of them would you believe would make dua for you if you committed a sin? How many would encourage you? Who are your circle of friends? Their dua saves people. And that is why the behavior of a responsible Muslim man and woman is to make dua for other Muslims. Oh Allah, allow them to overcome that sin because it benefits them. And that is why Allah said to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ Ask Allah to forgive your own sins. And ask Allah to forgive the sins of the believers as well. Make dua for them. When the Prophet of Allah, Nuh, he said, My Lord, forgive me. And forgive my mom and dad. And forgive any righteous believer who comes into my house. And the dua of Ibrahim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, My Lord, forgive me. And forgive my parents. And forgive all all of the believers on the day when the resurrection is established. Make dua for the righteous believers. Who are your circle of friends? Restructure it if you think that they will not make dua for you if you commit a sin. Number five, you can protect yourself from the aftermath of sins. When a righteous believer gifts you the reward of some of their good deeds. I feel that some of you, if not the majority, are hearing this for the first time. That this is actually a possibility to hand over the reward of some of your hasan out your good deeds to someone whom you love as though it was a gift. According to the majority of the scholars, this is possible. In fact, Ibn Taymiyyah himself, he said that the scholars of Ahl Sunnah are unanimously agreed that their financial acts of worship benefit people whom they are gifted for. There's no disagreement there. So I can give charity on your behalf and it benefits you. I can free a slave on your behalf and the reward can be gifted to you from me. So there's no difference of opinion in the financial acts of worship. Then you have aspects of dua. He said the scholars of Ahl 
Ahlus Sunnah are also agreed that the dua you make for someone else will benefit them. The janazah salah will benefit them. Making dua at their grave will benefit them. He said there is however a difference of opinion in the physical acts of worship. Can I carry out a physical act of worship and then hand over the reward of the good deeds to you, for example, i.e. to recite Quran with the intention of the reward being for you, or to pray two rak'ah, or to do a umrah with the intention of that going to you, or to fast with the intention of that reward going to you, or vice versa. Ibn Taymiyyah said, the correct opinion is that the reward of all of these actions benefit other people, all of them. And he said, this is the madhab of Abu Hanifa and Ahmad and many of the scholars of the Malikis and the Shafi'is. Number six, or when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam intercedes for you on the day of judgment. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will have several intercessions on the day of judgment. And other prophets will also have intercessions for their people on the day of judgment. However, he will be given the ultimate shafa'ah, the ultimate intercession. When all of humanity will look at the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Allah will give him a position and a status that does not belong to anyone but him. And the day of judgment, the reckoning will begin because of his intercession and humanity will be put out of their misery because of his intercession. So you need it and I need it. And that is why Bukhari narrates on the authority of Abu Huraira that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked the question, O Messenger of Allah, who will enjoy the greatest share of your intercession on the Day of Judgment? What did he say? My family, my friends, my companions, those who have memorized the most Quran? No, he said the ones who will enjoy the most of my intercession on the Day of Judgment, they are those who say, La ilaha illallah, purely from their heart. They will be the most happy with the shafa'ah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number seven, or when Allah tests you with difficulties in the life of this world, that also erases sins. What is it you're going through? A toothache? Is it a migraine you have? Is it an injury that hasn't healed? Is it a relationship that has recently fallen to pieces? Or is it money that you've lost? An investment that has flopped? Friends who've let you down? People who have backstabbed you? Bills that you can't pay? What is it? All of these things are causes for a person's sins to be erased. Hamas is Allah. He wants us to go to Jannah, but we are the ones who refuse. And that is why Ibn Mas'ud, he once came to visit the Prophet ﷺ when he was fevering. And he said to him, O Messenger of Allah, you're fevering so badly. He said, yes, the fevers I experience are twice in severity than the average human being. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, is that because Allah will give you twice a reward? He said, yes. And then he spoke about you and I. He said, and likewise, any believer who experiences any type of harm, be it the pricking of a thorn or something worse, than that. Allah will eliminate some of his sins because of it and will cause him to shed his sins the same way that a tree sheds its leaves. The hardship you are going through now and the grief that you are covering in your heart that only Allah knows about it and you, your sins are automatically being erased. Allah wants Jannah for us. Number eight, when Allah makes things difficult for a person in the grave, that also erases a person's sins. Even when you are in your grave and you're experiencing the squeezing of the grave or the darkness of the grave, the loneliness of the grave, before it is made into a garden of Jannah for the believer, sins are erased because of that suffering. Allah wants you to go to Jannah. Number nine, or when a person is tested by Allah during the horrors and the difficulties of the day of judgment, sins are erased that way as well. 50,000 years worth of standing beneath a sun that is one meal from the top of your head. It is a difficult day for those who have not prepared. Sins are erased. Number 10, your sins can be erased when Allah, the most merciful, chooses to have mercy upon you. La ilaha. Ibn Mas'ud, he said, Allah will forgive people on the day of judgment in a way that no human mind could ever imagine. Then Ibn Taymiyyah, he then concludes by saying, therefore, whoever misses out on every one of these 10 has no one to blame but himself.